So what I'm going to talk about today is Octopus Deploy, but more importantly, how to stop deploying like an idiot. Um, it's something we see a lot, so uh, hopefully a few little tips. So first, I want to introduce you to Frank. This is Frank. Say hi, Frank. Yep. He can't. He can't hear you. Um, so Frank is the uh, deployment manager. He does the deployments for Acme Corporation, right? And he's, um, he's developed this document, all this stuff that, that, he, that you do, you know, to do deployments for Acme Corp. And he's pretty proud of it, you know. He's got this, got this document that he's produced over many, many years. When he does a deployment, he'll pick up this document and he'll go through all of the items and check them off one by one, you know. And he's good at it. You know, he's really good. He's, uh, he's so good, in fact, he hasn't had a mistake in at least like three deploy deployments. You know, there was one, it was a couple of deployments ago where there was a bit of a mistake. But, you know, that wasn't his fault, right? It wasn't his fault. Um, what happened was Brian from the dev team, he left the web config in the package that he gave him and it just copied over the one in production. So, uh, Brian. Um, but if that hadn't happened, you know, it would have been, would have been fine. The checklist is sound, right? So, Frank's pretty proud of this process in general, you know? He's got this checklist, it's, it's really clean, it's really good. Right? So he's, he's happy. So Frank's an idiot. <laughs> um, there's nothing in Frank's checklist that can't be automated, right? And Frank's not automated. Frank makes mistakes. And the process makes mistakes. And that means sometimes deployments fail. So this is Octopus Deploy, right? It's Frank's replacement. Poor Frank. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Frank can stay, um, but he can just write PowerShell for Octopus. He seems happy. <laughs> so th look, this is what I'm going to talk about today, right? That's a little high level of what's important, but you're all here, so I'm sure you, you can appreciate these problems. So first we're going to have a look at what Octopus is, then we're going to have a look at how it works, and uh, we're going to run through some key concepts and then tell you how to get started. And by that point, you'll be so keen to throw money at it that, uh, that you'll log on and start signing up. That's my prediction. So uh, just first, a little bit about me. I'm a MVP in Visual Studio ALM, MSTS, MCSD, and MBA, and OMG, WTF, Barbecue. Um, I'm, a, I'm a solution architect for um, SSW, and I run the Brisbane office up there. Um, we've got another Brisbane guy, Ben, um, talking about payments later on today as well. Um, the stuff that I do day to day though, generally revolves around TFS itself and Scrum and the process, <coughs> development process. And then on the other side of the fence, I do a lot of web development, ASP.NET MVC and um, all, the, all the good web stuff as well. Uh, I also um, co-authored this book. Um, it's, yeah, the, the approximate cost of the book is about 300 hours of my life that I'll never get back. But it's good, there's a lot of information in there. So if you're using TFS and you want to upgrade to the latest versions, check it out. You should totally buy it. Um, all right, so let's get into it. Uh, intro to Octopus. So what is Octopus? Basically, it's a repeatable automated deployment tool for Windows and Azure. So it's built on the Microsoft stack and currently it only deploys to Microsoft servers and Azure and things like that. You can access the UI for Octopus using the browser, which is the usual way you do it. But it's also, um, you can use a REST API. Um, there's client libraries for C Sharp and some other things. And you can use the command line if all else fails as well. What it isn't, it is not a build tool. You still have to build the project yourself, okay? So if you're using TFS and MS Build and things like that, you're still gonna have to do that. If you're using Team City, you still have to do that. If you're using, I don't know, what else is there? Those are the only important ones. <laughs> <laughs> don't quote me. Um, it's also not deployable for Linux or OS X or mobile or whatever, okay? At the moment, that is coming soon. Maybe not the Walkman, that's probably pretty low on the backlog. Um, it's also not, and this is the worst joke ever, it's not an eight tentacle sea cruiser. See, five tentacles, <laughs> that's the logo. It's a quintopus. Um, so let's look at how it works in general, right? Basically, under the covers, it relies on NuGet. Who here uses NuGet pretty regularly? Yep, wow, that's nearly the whole room. That's awesome. Um, 
That's really good. So the benefit of NuGet, using NuGet under the covers, is it gives us packaging and versioning out of the box. So basically it means that when you package your project, whatever it is, into a NuGet package, it's got versioning for you, it's got all the files, all the dependencies, all that kind of stuff. And that's exactly what you need when you're deploying your own application. So from that point of view, it's perfect for packaging your stuff ready to be deployed. Right? So it's built on NuGet under the covers. It also provides NuGet server, uh, sorry, um, Octopus server will provide a NuGet feed that you can publish your stuff to as well. That's a relatively new addition. Um, so it gives you the opportunity to push these things to a NuGet feed directly in Octopus so you don't have to worry about where to store them. Um, so the parts of Octopus, Octopus the product, really there's just two parts. There's the head and then there's the tentacles. So the head is the application that you store, that you, sorry, that you install on the server. So you need a server component, right? It doesn't need to be very powerful, so just throw it on a web server that you already have. Um, and then the tentacles are little components that get installed on every single machine that you need to deploy to. Obviously, with the exception of some Azure stuff, it'll deploy to Azure without there um, really being a tentacle on there. It knows how to talk to Azure. Um, but if you're deploying to a web server or an app server or something that's in your control, then you install a little tentacle on there. Now, all of these little components are identified uniquely, and the communication happens over PKI, um, with X509 certificates and so on. It's 2048-bit two, bit keys, so it's probably not going to be hacked soon. If you're in that session over there, though, maybe they're having a go at it. Um, so they have UIDs, which they call squid, which is, I think they're stretching the um, octopus thing a bit far, but anyway. Um, so your server and your tentacles all talk to each other using this secure communication. So you don't need to worry about the traffic between them getting intercepted. And um, they're all uniquely identified so both sides know what's happening and what they're talking to. What the big advantage of this is it means that all of the processes, all of the steps that you do as part of your deployment run on the tentacles. You're not running them from a deployment server over here and making sure that that machine has domain privileges to do stuff on this machine over here. You don't have to worry about that at all. You can have just a local admin account with just the permissions that you need on the server over here, and then you run the tentacle as that account. So all Octopus Server is doing is saying to the tentacle, hey, here's the package that I want you to do, and here's the stuff that I want you to do with it. And everything runs locally which makes the security side of it much, much easier to handle. So that's a big advantage. So that's words on a slide and stuff I thought I'd show you in a bit more pictorially um, using my incredible um, art skills. Um, I drew this on the plane, not enough room for a mouse. So this is my finger on the trackpad. That's why it's so good. So if I was, sorry. MS Paint? MS Paint, no, straight into like PowerPoint. <laughs> Don't need it, anyway. I highly recommend not doing that. So um, we have our Octopus server sitting on a machine, and then we have, for this application, we have a web server, an app server, and a database server. And they've got these versions of these guys here. There's the web application, app, app server, and database server. So when we tell Octopus Deploy to do a release, what it does is it spits out this information, right, to all these tentacles. Hurts a little bit. Um, and then these tentacles get that information, and then they go and do their work, right? Now, this image shows it in parallel. It doesn't actually happen in parallel for the most part. Um, it's step by step. But what happens after that? You know, the tentacles do their bit. They upgrade their little components, and you know, everybody's satisfied. It's a great little deployment process. Is that clear? We have these new versions. That took me far too long. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, look, I just want to go over some of the key concepts of Octopus. We all understand roughly how it works, but some of the key concepts are the concept of a project, an environment, um, a role that a server will have, a process, which is the steps you need to, to deploy stuff, um, as well as there's variables you can use and also a library that you can plug into and things like that. So the best way to show you how to do this is really just to show you um, what it looks like in Octopus. Luckily, um, there's a demo.octopus.com, which means that I don't have to worry about setting all this stuff up. Um, so we go to demo.octopus.com. Can everyone see that or should I zoom in? I'll zoom in a bit. 
There we go. Using Bootstrap, so it looks pretty. Um, so here's an example of some projects. We've got three projects in this demo. There's an Octo Cloud, which is a cloud um, service running on Azure. There's a rate service, which is another service being deployed to somewhere, um, a Windows service. And then we've got a trading website. So all of these projects are grouped. There's cloud ones and there's OctoFX ones. So you can set up these groupings. So you can see all of them. You can see just those um, projects and so on. So what this really represents is a thing that you're deploying. So each one of these is a thing that you care about, a thing that you deploy. It doesn't mean it has to be one NuGet package. You could have a project which is your website which actually has, and we've done this on occasion, it has a website and it also has some test projects for UI testing and also some test projects for integration testing and maybe a web API package for a different project as well. But all of that is one thing that you want to deploy, so that all goes in one project. So you're telling Octopus when you, when it, you want it to release something, here's the project I want you to release. And the next thing is, here's the environment I want you to release it to. So we have the concept in Octopus of environments. So predictably, here we've got a development environment, a test environment, uh, and an acceptance and a production. So that's going to change depending on what you, what you care about. Um, we've got some advice a little bit later on on what environments to set up and how you should deploy to them and things like that. But ultimately, it means that um, you have these collections of servers that you call you know, this is your development environment, this is your test environment, and so on. You can see in this example, um, our development environment has one server on it, pretty standard. Um, and it also has these little tags here. Now those represent roles. So the way this works is you have an environment and it has certain machines in it, and those machines have different roles. And a role is a way of controlling what components get deployed to which servers. So with that little application there, if we had a web application which had some web API services, for example, you might want to deploy the web application to the web server and the web API stuff to the application server. Now in our test environment, that's the same server. Our app server and our web server are the same one. But if we go down to an, our, our acceptance testing, I'll scroll up a little bit, um, we can see we've, got, we've actually got two app servers. So we probably have a bit of load balancing going on there and we have one web server. So that same deployment process that we set up is going to deploy those two different components. It's going to deploy the web component to this server here and the app component, the web API one, to these ones, to both of them. All right? Pretty clear. So you've got these environments, you've got these servers, uh, and these servers have roles. Now the roles are just tags. You can have as many roles as you want and each server can have as many, um, as many of these roles as well. So it's pretty flexible that way. So the next main thing, what was the next main thing? Role, so we've done that. Let's look a little bit deeper at the process, okay? So the process is exactly what steps need to be run to deploy a project or to release a project, okay? So I'm looking at, this is the most interesting one on their demo. By the way, demo.octopusdeploy.com, if you want to have a scroll around, all the things are clickable. I'm not sure when it stops you from doing stuff, but you know, you can explore pretty deeply. So this is the process for our OctoFX trading website. Now we've got this surrounding guy here, which is a rolling deployment. So what that means is it'll run, each of the, it'll run all of those steps for one server, and then it'll go and run them all for the next server, and so on. If we didn't have that surrounding it, it would do that on all of the ones it applies to, and then that on all of the ones it applies to, and so on. So you can, you can do this kind of rolling deployment. There's a couple of interesting things here. We've got this rolling deployment. We're removing the server from the load balancer. We're deploying the website. And then we're adding it back into the web server. So that makes a lot of sense. Like if you're deploying a web application, you want to do that rolling deployment. Take one of them out of the um, farm and then update it and then put it back in and then pull another one out and do that. The other interesting thing is this tag here. So what we're saying is only do this in production, because it doesn't make sense in test, really, to pull something off a load balancer and go in. So you can filter these steps as well and say, this only applies in production. Uh, and that makes it you know, very easy to do. The other thing here, the web server bit. So these are steps that will only run 
on machines that are the web server role. Okay? So what you generally see with this is you have steps for deploying something to a web server, steps for deploying stuff to an app server, maybe a script to run some tests and things like that. You know, all that kind of um, easy stuff. Um, so let's just have a look. We, if we add a new step, there's a few things. Oh, sorry, I won't do it inside there. Um, you get a little less control inside one of these. So there's a few things that come out of the box. We can deploy a NuGet package, which basically means unpack it somewhere. Um, we can run a PowerShell script. And under the covers, everything runs on PowerShell anyway. Um, we can send an email. This one you should never ever use. That's my personal opinion, uh, which is manual intervention, because then Frank's back in his job. Um, Frank's a nice guy. Anyway. Um, you can deploy to Azure. You can upload files by FT FTP. And you can stop services and things like that. Now, ex you'd expect this list to grow. These guys are pretty, um, pretty on the ball with this kind of stuff. Um, the other side of it is that um, with these processes, you can actually grab some stuff from a library. So you can get packages from other places. You can get um, external feeds, so different packages from NuGet.org if you want, or from other projects. This one's the interesting one, though, this step template. So here they've got a template for that stop a service um, step. Now that's great, but because there's only a few of these little steps that you have available to you, they've just, re just recently released this community library, so library.octopusdeploy.com. And there's a ton of these things that people have released. So these are ultimately just PowerShell scripts, and then there's a little bit of metadata around it about variables and things like that. But you know, file system backups, um, regex file find and replace, git push and pull, hipchap notify, which we've used in a, on a couple of, of occasions, um, stopping IIS stuff, you know, creating queues, all sorts of stuff. So this has currently 56. When I wrote this slide, it had 53, um, which obviously was ages ago because it's so um, well prepared. Anyway, so um, there's. <coughs> There's all of these things that you can do. And if you write a PowerShell script that you think can be reused, you can publish to here as well, and other people can start using it. So you'd expect there to be a lot of these, these other uh, libraries made available. Excellent. Oh, the other thing I didn't show you was the variables. So um, in our project steps that we were looking at, so in our process, we have some things, uh, we have some steps, and th some of those steps can re rely on variables as well. This one doesn't have any. Let's have a look at the rate service. Also doesn't have any. Good, so that, oh, if this one doesn't have anything, this is gonna be the best demo ever. There we go. Um, so what we have is a series of variables. We've got an application environment name, which actually pulls something from Octopus itself. So, um, you know, there are variables we can use that are part of Octopus already. So things like versions, the name of the package, the name of the environment, all sorts of stuff. But then we have cloud service names for the different clouds for the different environments. So you can scope these variables. So when you deploy, if you're deploying to production, it will use this in place of this variable, this cloud service name variable. That's pretty straightforward. Um, you can also have secure variables as well, so passwords and things like that, and mark them as secure, and it will store them encrypted, and it won't show you what they are here. So you don't have to worry about that stuff getting out in the wild. So if we have a look in the process where that's actually used, we can see the first one is deploying this package to this cloud service. So that cloud service name is grabbed from the variables, so you have different ones for production, development, testing, all that kind of stuff. So that gives you the power over changing a few things based on, you know, based on where you're deploying it to. All right. So just to recap on this, a project is a thing you're deploying. It can be one or more packages, one or more projects, or like VS projects, but ultimately it's a thing that you want to deploy in one hit. An environment is essentially just a collection of servers, and those servers will have different roles. The role is basically a defined purpose for a server. And finally, that process is the steps that you need to deploy. Now, just before we go on to the next 
point. Any quick questions about that? We're trying, I'm trying to make up time based on the previous one, but yeah? So the question was, if you have more than two machines... Um, the, the process there for load, removed from load balancer, yep. how do you prevent both from coming out at the same time? So the question was about um, the load balancer, how do you prevent both of them from coming out at the same time? And that's what this surrounding guy is, that's a rolling one. So what that will do is it'll grab all of the web server, all of the ones in a web server role, and it'll do all of these steps to one of those servers, and then it'll do all the steps to the next server. So if you have server A, It'll pull server A off the load balancer, then run this step, and then put it back in the load balancer. And then it'll pull server B out of the load balancer, deploy, and put it back in. So that's why you have this rolling website. Otherwise, it just goes step by step. Does that answer the question? Cool. Any other questions quickly before we move on? Yeah? So if you wanted to scale... So to add another server. Ah, okay. So the question was if you wanted to scale out, to so add another server rather than um, creating a new deployment. Yep, so absolutely. So the environment stuff here, if I wanted to add a new web server to here, I click that button, or I install the tentacle on that other server, then I click this button and tell it to discover it for me and um, now we have a new web server. And the next time I do a deployment, it'll go there as well. So yeah. Definitely, it helps to do that. All right, I might move along. Uh, yep, sorry, I'll one more. Do you use this deployment to only deploy the stuff or Yeah, so the question was, I think, um, does it only deploy .NET stuff? Yeah. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, it's built around .NET, but if you can get whatever files and whatever packages you want into a NuGet package, Octopus will unpack that NuGet package for you regardless of what's in it. It doesn't have to be a Visual Studio or um, .NET project. So you could have just a collection of HTML files, for example, or a Ruby project. You just have a step to unpack that to a location, and then you might run a PowerShell script to do any other kind of deployment. The, the thing that, will, that may stop you is, at the moment, you can only do it to Windows machines, at the moment. So if your project is, only, is running on a Linux box, for example, you can't deploy there right now. So that's coming. Does that answer the question? Um, how, how about if I want to deploy a PHP there? Is that okay here? Yeah, so if you want to deploy a PHP one, exactly the same thing. That a PHP is um, interpreted, I believe, so you just need the files. So if, as long as you can put those files in a NuGet package, which you can do just using NuGet.com um, command line, you can do that. So whatever your build process is, um, you can package that into a NuGet package and then get Octopus to deploy that, throw it in the location. So yes, you can absolutely do that, provided it's running on Windows. All right, so I'll move on. A couple of little facts. You notice there that you have the same process for every environment, regardless of what that environment is. That little star is that little indicator to say, you can say this only applies in production, or this only applies in staging, or it only applies in these three environments, for example. So that's a little bit misleading. You can do it, it's just if you have too much variation, you're going to end up with a thousand steps and some of them will only run on different machines. So it helps you keep your process consistent between the environments. That's the good thing about it. Everything's built on PowerShell. So even those out of the box tools for deploy to Azure, that's still just a PowerShell script. Um, and that means essentially anything you can do on a server that you can do with PowerShell, which I'm not a sysadmin, but I'm pretty sure that's everything in the world ever then you can do that in Octopus. That can be one of the steps for your deployment. But that means that really clever processes are possible. So here's a screenshot where I've changed the names of some things, and it's too small to read anyway. But what this does is it deploys a web application to a web server. It deploys a web application to an HTTPS web server as well. Um, it deploys web tests to another server that we have for testing from the web. Um, it runs those web tests, so they hit the production or the whatever it is, the web server. Then it will change the web configs on that server that you've deployed to. So now it points at real data and it'll run integration tests over there to make sure you get all that information back. If all that succeeds, then it will notify HipChat, which is the little chat application, and then your deployment is successful. So there's a lot of stuff you can do um, with this. So that's one example. All right, so how am I going for time? Awesome. Um, 
So how to get started, right? So obviously you're partly sold. I'm just going to sell the rest. So here's how you do it. Um, you install Octopus Server. You install the tentacles on all the machines you want to deploy to. And then you configure it. You set up environments. You set up your projects. You put your steps in. You do all that kind of stuff. And trust me, you will not get it right first time. It's going to be an iterative process. Um, the number of the, the amount of time that that build will, or that deployment will be read until you get it right, you know, it's just par for the course. But once it's green, then you know, it's smooth. The other thing you need to do if you're using Visual Studio in a .NET project is add a NuGet package called Octopack to your project. This is the easiest way to get your project into a NuGet package that Octopus can understand. So you add a NuGet package to your project, and then you just make a small change to your build process, whatever that is, just to tell it to run Octopack, which will package it up into a NuGet package, and optionally do other things like publish it to a feed or dump it in a location or something like that. So to install, really easy, octopusdeploy.com slash downloads. There's a server download for 32-bit and 64-bit, uh, same with the tentacle, 32 and 64-bit, and there's also a command line one if you just want to use that. Um, and then you have to introduce the server and the tentacles. Now there's a really easy way to do this. On your Octopus server, you just say add machine, and then you give it the IP address or the host name of that machine. The port, unless there's firewall problems, there's really no, no need to change that. It's what, 10,933 by default. And if you're using that one by chance, then change it. Um, <coughs> but what that does is it will go and ping that location and go, hey, are you a tentacle I can talk to? Oh, great. And then it will do its communication between the two, establish a secure connection, and then you're done. You have that machine. To configure it, you'd set up a NuGet feed in Octopus. So I mentioned there's a NuGet, um, NuGet feed that Octopus <coughs> provides. So you can just set that up um, or just use the existing one. Here's an example of one being set up for just a file location. So you can dump it in a file location. Uh, dump these NuGet packages and it'll work like a NuGet feed. Um, so you set one of those up, you create an environment, and then you add machines and give them roles. So your web servers and your app servers and your database servers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you create a project and you add your process, process <coughs> steps. So pretty clear, pretty straightforward. Adding Octopack, so Octopack is basically a NuGet package that packages NuGet packages. Right? Simple. Um, it's it, very easy to do. It doesn't have to be a web project. It can be any kind of .NET project. You just add it, and um, it basically lets your build process package this thing up as part of it. Um, each of those packages, like I said before, represents a version of your software. So Octopus knows when you run this Octopack and create a NuGet package, because NuGet has this versioning stuff built in, it's just going to know you've got a new version of your software, a new version of your component. To add it to your build, um, who here uses Team City to do their builds? Okay, maybe five, ten percent. Who uses TFS? Uh, it's about a third of the room. Like, who uses something else? Well, that's probably you know everybody who didn't put their hand up before. Um, what do you what do you use apart from those two? Bamboo, Jenkins. Yep. So um, there's probably a solution for that. For those. So if you go to this uh, doc. Uh, in the documents, Octopus and Deploy, and then have a look at API and integration, there's a list of build stuff that will do it. So it tells you how to do it in Bamboo, it tells you how to do it in Jenkins, and there's a handful of others as well. But ultimately, if you're using MS Build to build your process, all you need to do is have this argument at the end, and that will tell Octopack, if it's part of that build, if you've added that as a NuGet package, to turn that into a NuGet package. Now, there's other arguments you can give, things like publish, to Octopus or publish to somewhere else and even trigger a deployment. So you can do the full continuous integration here. As part of your build, you have this argument to package it into a NuGet package, you have another one to publish it to Octopus and another one to tell Octopus to start a release for development or for test or something like that. So you can build this completely into your CI process. So here's the basic steps, just you know, compress down as much as I can get it. You build and create a NuGet package, so you use Octopack for that if you can. You tell it to publish that to a feed, and Octopus will provide a feed for you. And then you tell Octopus to do a release. And whether that's clicking on the release button, or um, passing an argument to Octopus, or calling a command line, or using its 
REST API or however you want to do it. That's really the steps. And then it'll run through the process in whatever, whatever environment you've told it to do and everybody's happy. Cool. A little bits of advice that I'll give you um, based on having done this a few times. It's a good idea to set up continuous integration into a dev or test environment. That way it'll tell you immediately whether you've broken something. Um, it's even better if you have tests as part of that process. So whether they be unit tests or UI tests or integration tests or whatever it is, if you have some tests, you can build your process or check something in and then know that it's going to go all the way through to Octopus and Octopus is going to let you know if you've broken something straight away. And immediately there's a version of your application ready for people to play with. I'd also suggest that you get it to promote automatically to a point. So if it passes your you know, smoke test environment or dev environment or whatever it is, at the end of that deployment, you can get Octopus to trigger the next one to say, oh great, that worked, let's go to staging, for example. But do it to a certain point, right? That way you've got a little bit more visibility. So this is, this is just continually pushing the envelope. Do the CI stuff first, but then try and get it a little bit further all the way to a staging environment or something like that. Now, I know this is not something that I'm supposed to say, but I always like manually promoting to production. This whole like continuous integration, you check something in and it's in production an hour later or 10 minutes later or something. That's fantastic, but your tests, like somebody who I'm not gonna know who to quote, said, you know, a test will show the presence of a bug, it's not gonna show the absence of a bug, right? So you can test as much as you want, but something can still slip through. So at some point, maybe somebody's got to go and have a look at the application and make sure it really works. So that last step, it's generally a good idea to keep that as a manual click. And that's one click. You go to the staging build and you just say promote and it will do it. It's probably a couple of clicks actually. Promote, yes, I'm sure. Yeah, I totally am sure. Um, use the library that's made available as well. Before you just go and start hacking in PowerShell, have a look to see what's on there. Now this thing was a godsend. I spoke to um, Paul Stavels, one of the founders and um, original authors of um, Octopus Deploy. And a little while ago, some previous versions, he said, oh, what stuff should we do? And I said, you need some you know, more tasks. There's like four of them in there. And otherwise I've got to write a PowerShell script. And he goes, oh yeah, here's a URL. They just hadn't published it yet. So that's there now. Um, so there's a library of stuff and it's gonna grow. Um, now, if you're a massive enterprise with huge layers of bureaucracy and TFS and things like that, um, have a look at release management for Visual Studio, or release, manage, or release management it is actually, for Visual Studio. Um, it's basically the same product. It's a little bit more complicated and it gives you a little bit more control. You have different processes for each environment, um, but it integrates a lot closer with TFS. So um, you can trace uh, who approved stuff as work items and all this kind of stuff. And that's, Microsoft's putting a lot of effort into that as well. Um, so have a look at that if you're using TFS as well. It'd be remiss of me to not mention the Microsoft product, seeing as I wrote a chapter about that. So it's a good product as well. Um, right, so by this point, obviously you're like, you know, shut up and hand me money. So um, I don't actually sell this product, but if you would really like to give me money, I'm probably going to accept it. Um, no, you buy it online. Um, one thing I will say though is if you have five projects or less, ten users or less, and five tentacles or less, it's just free. The benefit of this, especially for a consulting company like the one that I work for, is that you can go into a client and say, look, let's just try it. We'll try it with one web application. You know, what's the harm? It doesn't cost us anything. Just install a couple of things here and there. We'll try it. Every single time I've been involved in that process, saying just try it, within a month, they've bought it and they're using it for as much stuff as they can. And I'm, I'm not lying, every single time I've gone into a client and said just try it, it's been adopted, like within a couple of months. So there are different pricing models. For a big enterprise, this is like, this is pennies, it's nothing. Um, so there's professional ones, they all have different limits. If you're an enterprise, buy, buy the $5,000 thing and then use it for everything always. Um, if you want the source code as well, there is an option to do that, but that's one of those contact us ones. So I'm sure the first question is, how much money have you got? Um, 
I'm, I'm sure they're reasonable about it. But yeah, um, so you can do it with the source code as well if you really want to. If you need help when you're doing this stuff, um, first port of call, docs.octopusdeploy.com. So there's some great documentation around this. It's really good. And half of the pages don't have like wall of text. They've got a video showing you how to do it. So that's really, really handy. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, there's also a support page which gives you links, obviously, to the documentation, but also to support forums and an email address, um, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, if you're still stuck, um, Octopus Deploy has two partners in Australia, um, SSW, obviously, and Redify is the other big partner. Um, Paul, Stavell is, uh, Paul Stavell actually worked for both companies at one point in his career. So, um, but that's unrelated to this. Uh, we are partners because we love the product, basically. Uh, and if there's something in Octopus Deploy that you don't like, or something that's not in Octopus Deploy that you would like, um, there's a user voice page as well. And they're very active on that. Um, they are actually responding to these, these things, so. Excellent. There's a few things that are coming soon in Octopus. Linux deployments or more, more specifically, deployments over SSH. Um, so that could be anything that supports that, I guess. Um, and other tentacles running on other things. Um, passing variables between each step. So you could run a step and as a result, produce a variable that gets passed to the next step, which can be useful in certain situations. Um, there's some more flexible per environment steps. So at the moment, you have to rely on um, saying this step runs for this environment, but that's as much control as you get. So they're improving that a little bit. Um, parallel steps as well. So where, we're, where we said before, sorry, we, the example I gave had the rolling deployment. So that's explicitly run all these things at one server at a time, right? But if you don't have that rolling deployment, you just have these series of steps that run one after the other. What you could do if you wanted to is say, all of these five steps that I've got here, they're deploying all the stuff to all the servers. I don't care what order you run them in. In fact, you should be running them all at the same time. They're different machines. So that's coming as well. If the first step is deploy my stuff and then we'll do our tricky stuff, um, that's where this is gonna come in really handy. Um, and better support for rollback. So this is, a, this is one that is a little bit tricky to do at the moment. So if a deployment fails, it's not gonna automatically undo anything. Um, there are ways to do it, things like um, have steps to say if it fails. So you can actually say this step only runs if the previous steps have failed or something in the previous ones have failed. So that's how you implement your rollback. But if you've already copied all your stuff over your um, web application, then you know, you've copied it over, it's gone. So you'd have to have steps to pull the previous version and copy that back over or steps up front to back it up and then steps at the end to put it back over and things like that. So it's a little bit tricky at the moment. So they're improving that as well. There we go. Even, even Frank's happy. <laughs> Thanks. So I think we've got a minute or two for questions if you want as well, yeah? Uh, so Team City, there's actually a plugin. Sorry, I didn't go into that in much depth, but Team City, there's actually a plugin for Team City that they make available. Um, and what it does is you can add a step in your build process, um, which is an octopus stuff and you can say, uh, it, it'll talk to your Octopus server as well. So you can say, um, trigger deployment for this, um, like for this uh, environment. So you could say things like, as one of the steps of your build, one of the steps is build an Octopus deploy package. And then you'd have another step which would be trigger a deployment to dev in Octopus. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, the, sorry. I'll repeat the question. So, the question is, what's the difference between just letting Team City do it and letting you do it? I guess um, if you're happy with the way that Team City does its deployments, that's great. I don't actually know how Team City does its deployments under the covers. Um, what I do know, though, is Octopus gives you a lot of power um, because you can run anything on the deployment machine uh, as a local admin user or whatever it is. So you don't have to worry about your Team City server having permissions. Now, I don't know whether that's a problem with Team City. Do the commands get run from the Team City server or do they get run from uh, things running on your web server or on your app server?
So most of the solutions I've seen rely on your server having full control over everything else in your domain. That's great if you can do that, but some things that um, might happen, like if you're deploying to a VM that's on Azure and you don't have domain, um, a domain relationship between the two machines, then there's not really going to be much you can do with your Team City server to give it full trust over in your Azure VM. So Octopus gets around that by just sending the information to something running on that VM and letting it do it all locally. So I think that's the biggest advantage of something like Octopus and Release Manager as well, or Release Management for Visual Studio does it exactly the same way. There's a little component that runs on the server, on the servers that does the work. So I think that's the biggest difference. Yep. Ah, so I didn't, so the question is the community, community edition limited to 10 users, how do you define 10 users? Is that users using your system or using Octopus? Oh, it's users using Octopus, okay. yeah. So that community edition, just to clarify, um, is five projects, and we've seen what a project is, what is it? Five projects, five projects, 10 users, and that's Octopus users. So when you do a deployment, that gets marked against a user who does that deployment. Or if you go in and you change the process steps and things like that, I'm logging in as a user. So, yep. so 10 users would be 10 servers that we're No, so 10, uh, 10 users would be 10 so logins for Octopus, yeah. So in general, like if you have a team of 10 and you need everybody to be able to change these processes, that's going to be 10 user accounts. Unless, of course, you just share them and don't care whose name goes against a release or a change. I'm not recommending that, but you can technically maybe do that. Yeah. Cool. Yes. So the question was non-profit organization. And I'm going to refer to this internet thing that I've got. Um, let's have a look. Uh, what is it? Store, buy online. Because the answer is I don't know. So there's a community edition. Um, I would contact them and find out whether they offer discounts for or you know free editions for non-profits. Um, yep. I, if you go to the contact page, they're generally pretty responsive actually. So yeah. Sorry, there's a question over here. So the question was, deployment to cloud, does it only support Windows Azure or does it support AWS or things like that? Um, the answer is out of the box, there's a um, step that you can put in your process to deploy to Azure. So it already knows about whatever PowerShell script is needed for that. However, if you were to write your own PowerShell script to deploy to AWS, then yeah, absolutely, you can do that. So. Um, Let's just have a look, see if there's something about AWS. Nope. So you're going to have to write that one yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can write that one yourself. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I know you can use PowerShell to deploy to AWS. So um, if you wanted to do it, you should write a PowerShell script to deploy to AWS and then package it into a shared library step and put it on here. Yeah. Put it in the library so everybody else can use it. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so the, the question was, does it have a screen to monitor the process? Um, so that's what you see as a dashboard. It shows you which version is deployed to each environment for each application. And then when you look at an actual deployment, these ones are finished, but while they're running, it will go through this list and mark them off. So it actually uses SignalR to talk between um, the, the web and the server under, underneath. So that updates in real time. It'll keep, keep updating. Um, if one of these fails, for example, you can go into a bit more detail and see exactly what happened as well. So it gives you that um, progress. The other thing is, this says success in a big bold thing. If it's running, it'll show you, a, hey, I'm working on stuff. Yeah. Yep. So the question is, if, um, if a build fails, um, does it communicate back to, for example, Team City to tell it that it's failed? And yes, the Team City plugin will actually do that. So when you add that Octopus deploy step and say trigger a release to this environment, um, there's actually a checkbox that says fail this build in Team City if it fails in Octopus. Um, so yes, you can do that. MS build? Mm, don't know. Not sure, actually. So I'm not sure what happens with TFS. Of course, TFS basically has a REST API now anyway. So you could, as part of your Octopus step, hit TFS to say, this thing failed, don't do anything else. Or, you know, or if it succeeds, more to the point, 
it succeeded, now run this build. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, if there's no more questions, I might uh, wrap up. So thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>